Okay, so we had started uh, um, this chapter last time. Uh, this chapter sort of had two parts to it. Static equilibrium, static equilibrium meaning when forces and torques act on an extended object, uh, forces and the torques of these forces act on an extended object, we want s some objects, we want a lot of our structures to be at rest. Okay? And so we studied the conditions for that. And then today we'll s study elasticity. Okay? So we'll do the second part of the chapter. But uh, before I get into that, let me review what we did last time. Okay. So you saw that if you had a point object, the only condition you need for it to be at rest is that the sum of all the forces acting on it be zero. Okay. Even if you had an extended object, if the forces were acting through the center of mass, if these forces added up to zero, this object will remain at rest. Okay? But that changes if the forces are not going through the center of mass. Okay. So for instance, here are two forces that act on this object. See their sum is zero. But as you can see, this object will make this object spin. These forces will make this object spin like that. Okay? So this force about the center of mass has a counterclockwise torque, meaning it'll make it spin counterclockwise. And this force also about the center of mass has a clock counterclockwise torque. Okay? It'll make it spin counterclockwise. So you see, even though the forces add up to zero, their torques are both positive and they don't add up to zero counterclockwise torques are taken positive okay? and clockwise torques are taken negative. Okay? So even though the forces add up to zero, their torques do not add up to zero. In this case, the forces add up to zero. This is a counterclockwise torque. That's a clockwise torque. Okay? This force will have a counterclockwise torque about the uh, center of mass this force will have a clockwise torque about the center of mass. Okay, so this would be a positive torque and as long as they're the same distance, the two torques will cancel. This condition is satisfied. And this object will neither move nor rotate. Okay. All right, so what we saw was, so the first part of the chapter was when several forces act on an extended object, for this to be at rest, meaning for it to have a zero acceleration and a zero angular acceleration, two conditions must be satisfied. The sum of these forces must be zero, and the torques of these forces must add up to zero. Okay, you guys understand? All right, so we said that you'll do a course, statics course, and that entire course will be based on these two equations. Okay. All right, so that was the first part of the chapter. Okay. So um, again, we define center of gravity of an object. The center of gravity and center of mass are, of an object are the same for small objects. Here was the formula for center of mass. This is m mass of this little piece times x1 mass of that little piece times x2 and so on. For center of gravity, what you have to do is multiply it by g at that location. And if the object is small, then g is the same everywhere. That'll come out as common and it'll cancel. And this formula would reduce to that. So for small objects, center of gravity and center of mass are the same. Anyway, the reason we want center of gravity is when you're looking at objects, when, you're, when we're analyzing objects, we need to know where the weight of the object acts. And it acts at the center of gravity. <clears throat> All right. So for instance, here's a ladder leaning against the wall and let's, we 
haven't shown anybody on the ladder, but if you climb the ladder, of course, no matter where you are on the ladder, what, what do you want? You want the ladder not to slip, okay? So what you do is you look at all the forces acting on the ladder, okay? And if you, if you don't want the ladder to slip, what is it that you want? These two conditions to hold. The sum of all the forces on the ladder should be zero. And the torques of all these forces should add up to zero. When this is true, then this will be true. And that's what you're looking for. Okay? It, the center of mass won't accelerate and uh, it, it, won't, it won't have angular acceleration. Okay? So here are the various forces acting on this object and the location of the forces. And you want the point of action of the forces to calculate the torques of individual forces. Okay. This is what is called a free body diagram. Okay. And again, for this object to be in static equilibrium, you want these two equations to be satisfied. Okay. So we saw all of this last time. Okay. So there are the two conditions. Okay. So that's that. And that is that condition. Sum over the torques of all the forces. So what we are saying here is generally we'll right now we'll consider problems where the forces are in acting in a plane so they'll only have an x and a y component and the torques of these forces will only have a z component okay so you will be dealing with three equations and you know that when you have three equations how many unknowns can you solve for three unknowns so those are the kinds of problems we'll deal with <coughs> All right, so here's uh, another situation. Okay, so you see the scaffolding structure in construction sites, and you know, this person, he, no matter where he is, he doesn't want the cable snapping or the hinge breaking. Okay. So you have to analyze this situation. Okay. So the calculations you'll be in, the types of calculation you'll do is, you will want to know what is the maximum tension this thing will bear with the heaviest load on the on the scaffolding. Okay, and then what do you do? You calculate the maximum tension and then put a wire that can bear at least twice that tension, right? For safety. All right. All right. So you don't want this plank plank to move or the scaffold to move. So you look at all the forces acting on this guy. So let's do a free body diagram. And here's the free body diagram. There is the tension the cable is exerting on the on the plank. Okay. So that's the tension in the cable. Here is the weight of the plank itself. Here is the weight of the person. And here is the force that the hinge is exerting on the plank. Okay. So We've shown all the forces acting on the plank and also the location at which these forces are acting. Okay? And now you're set to analyze the situation. Okay? And now if you don't want this plank to move, okay? of course this fellow doesn't want the plank to move, so the sum of all these forces should add up to zero and the torques of all these forces should be zero. Okay? Now the torque of a force, you saw that depends on what point you're calculating the torque about. Okay. So for instance, this would be Ri for that force. Okay. So if you're calculating the torque about that point, this would be Ri for that, this would be Ri for this guy, and so on. Okay, so it seems like this should depend on what point you calculate the torque about. Okay, but there is a theorem that says if the torque about some point is zero, then it'll be zero about any point. Yeah. So you can calculate the torques about any point. 
All right, again, uh, when we do problems, you'll understand this better, okay? So in this diagram, what we've done is we've just written the components of this tension. We've written this force as the sum of these two forces. So we replaced this by its x and y component. This force has been replaced by that, and so on. <coughs> all right. So we saw all of that. Um, all right, now we can talk about the second part of the chapter. Okay, so here's where we are going at. Um, so you, you, we have structures like this in our lives, and uh, you when you when you put an extra load when you drive by on drive on this bridge, when you add weight to the bridge, the cables stretch because the cables have to pull back support additional weight, and so they stretch a little. Okay? Now, when you, so when you're off the bridge, what you want is the cable to go back to its original shape. You want the cable to exhibit elastic behavior. It's like a rubber band. You stretch, stretch a rubber band, and when you let go, you want the rubber band to go back to its original shape. Okay? Why do you want the rubber band to go back to its original shape? You want to use it again. So you stretch it, and you want it to go back. You don't want the rubber band to get weaker, right? How many times do you want to use it? Millions and millions of times. Okay. All right, so you want your components of your structure to exhibit elastic behavior. Okay. And that's what uh, we want to do. So that's what we'll study. All right, so let's look at it at the molecular level. Okay, so let's say here is a beam, metal beam. And let's say you apply a 100-pound force. You apply a 100-pound force, and so that was the original length of the beam, and it stretches a little. It stretches a little and then stops stretching. Why did it stretch, how much it stretched, whatever length it stretched, and then why did it stop? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, so I'm saying I applied a 100-pound force to this. It stretched this much. So the question is, why did it stretch that much? And then after having stretched that much, it stopped. Okay, And you can do this in a lab, so... Uh, so in, in general, you apply a 100-pound force, it stretched that much. If you apply a 200-pound force, it'll stretch twice as much. Okay? So why is that happening? Yep. Yeah. further. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Like this I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. oh, the spring, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so here's a simplistic model of this metal. In a solid like that, the metals are arranged, uh, the atoms are arranged in a regular pattern. And the forces between the atoms can be modeled by a spring. Okay. So now when you s apply a 100 pound force in this direction let's say you apply a 100 pound force in this direction what happens is each of these the spacing between every atom increases it stretches this much and so this atom is pulling him back in that direction okay and the stretch is such that all these forces add up to 100 pound okay and that's why it stopped there. If you apply a 200 pound force, it has to stretch twice as much so that those forces add up to 200 pounds. Okay. And now what you don't want is, okay, so once, what you want is once you remove this force, once you remove the load, you want all the atoms to go back to their original shape as if nothing happened. You don't want any cracks developing and stuff like that.
Okay. Did you guys understand that? All right. So, so what you want to do is once you remove the stress, you want it to go back to its original shape. Okay. And that is elastic behavior. Okay. And you want that to happen forever. <laughs> okay. And you want that to happen for cheap. <laughs> right. All right. So, it turns out that all structures will deform. Okay. So, if you... So here's a concrete block. You apply, this is called a tensile stress. Okay? It's called a tensile stress when you want to, when the length of this increases. Okay? This is called a compressive strength, a stress when the length decreases. Yep. So you apply a tensile stress. Once the stress is removed, it should go back to its original shape. Okay? So, again, uh, when an object is either under tension, tension or compression, the object deforms by changing its uh, length. Internal forces that, that arise because of deformation balance the external force. So this 100-pound force is balanced by the internal forces that equal the external force. Okay. All right. Yeah. So what this is saying is the following. Uh, <clears throat> so here are materials, steel. Uh, that this is giving you the strength. Okay. So the tensile strength of steel is 500 megapascals, and compressive strength is 500 megapascals. Okay. What this is saying is. Um, um, so you take a steel beam, uh, you take a steel beam, and uh, the stress stresses uh, and strain is in megapascals. That is, force per unit area. Okay. So a steel beam is equally strong in, under tensile stress and compressive stress. Okay. So for the same stress, it'll compromise whether you're applying it this way or this way. Okay whether you're applying the force in, in a stretching mode or in a compressive mode. Look at this for, the, for concrete. For concrete, the tensile strength is two megapascals. The compressive strength is 20 megapascals. Okay, so this is the first thing you want to learn as a civil engineer. Okay, here is a concrete block. If you exert it to tensile stress, it's 10 times weaker than compressive stresses. All right, so in a, in a structure, concrete structure, if you want large, the structure to bear large loads, what do you want to make sure? That those loads are compressive loads rather than tensile loads, okay? Well, we'll come to that. So the answer to your question is, so right there on the last sheet. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, you learned that uh, most of the stuff, you'll see that most of the stuff most materials are strong under compressive strength. Their compressive strength is greater than their tensile stress. So uh, steel, it's roughly the same. For cast iron, it's almost three times, four times stronger under compression. Okay. And cast iron just is steel with more carbon in it. Okay. All right, so that's the idea behind the structure, a structure like this. Okay. So let me quickly go over this. Are you guys following this? You guys understanding this? Okay. So the idea behind a suspension bridge is what is what? Why do you build suspension bridges? One of the things you can do is you can make the span fairly high. And also this 
a suspension bridge takes a lot less material than let's say a stone bridge okay you can build a much larger span bridge and all that but here and you can build this with a lot less material but anyway so let's see what's going on here let's look at the forces briefly okay so let's say you have a bunch of cars driving and then you have to support a total load of a million pounds. Okay. All right, where is that million pounds going? This million pounds has to be transferred to the ground and these are the only two structures that are in contact with the ground. So here is 500 pounds, here is 500 pounds. Five hundred thousand pounds. What kind of stress is that? That's a compressive stress. See, you transferred the load. The largest compressive load was five hundred thousand pounds, and it was a compressive stress applied to your structure. Well, how did that get there? Okay, well, let's do that. So these are the cables. So. I'm going to keep it simple. That's a um, that's a, a million pounds. So let's say there are a hundred cables. Each cable is is bearing ten thousand pounds. Okay. And this cable, what is happening? This cable is pulling on the road that way and that way. So um, this is a uh, well. The load is pulling the cable this way. And this cable is so. This is a tensile stress on the cable. Okay, so because of the load, the load is the road is pulling down on the cable. The stress is tensile stress, but that's a small stress. Okay, each cable is being pulled apart. So each cable is bearing that tensile stress. And what are these cables doing? So that cable is pulling this cable down so in return this cable pulls him down so all these cables are pulling him down and these cables are pulling this thick cable down which is transferring that tension down to him which is transferring it making it a compressive stress and that's the idea okay so that was the load you wanted to lift you distributed it as a smaller tensile stress amongst all these cables which were pulling this guy out, which was a tensile stress on this cable, which was transferring that to there. Yep. Ultimately, you turned it into a compressive stress. Yep. And that's the idea. Okay. So again, where did, it, where did this all start? By noticing these numbers on this table. Okay, and so this is the kind of stuff material scientists will do for you. Okay. Some of the things they'll do. Okay, they want the strength of materials, and so you'll do a course like that as well. Okay. and what, where were the structures the strongest under whatever kind of stress? That's the kind of stress you apply in a structure. Okay. Mm. Mm, I guess it's got a more regular crystalline structure. Yeah. All right, let's answer your question now. Uh, so the concrete is greater under compressive stress. You don't want to stretch concrete. You want to compress it. Okay, so let's go to that. Okay, so let's say you build a span of bridge, a bridge span and uh, a car drives by when a, or a truck drives by this will depress a little and so this point the underneath its length increased the underside of the span went underwent tensile stress this length decreased so that was compressed so cracks will develop here because tensile stress is on uh, concrete doesn't bear tells tensile stress it can bear stronger compressive stress. So this will never crack. This will crack at the bottom. Okay. And so 10 years later, you got a 
build another bridge, okay? And you don't want to do that. So, but you're smart, so what you do is just you put steel rods, okay, in there. And so by doing that, you're decreasing the amount of stretch, okay? But then you're even smarter than that. Here's what you do. You take these steel rods, stretch them out, hold them under tension. Then pour concrete on top of it. Let the concrete set and then let go of the tension. So now they're under permanent compressive stress. And now when a truck goes by, they're just going back to their original length. This is pre-stressed concrete. Okay? So you learn all kinds of tricks to make a stru structure last longer. Did you guys understand that? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so again, this is an important table. Okay. And uh, so here's, um, so generally, like I said, uh, stuff is uh, stronger under compressive stress. So for instance, you have a bar like this, the top is under feeling tensile stress because its length increased, the bottom, uh, the length decreased, which is feeling compressive stress. So if the bar cracks, it'll be it'll crack at the top, just like the bridge will always crack at the bottom. Okay. All right, I've been using these terms, stress and strain. Okay. So let's say you have an object like this, and you you're applying forces like that, decreasing its volume. Okay, now if you don't want this moving, so you would have to apply forces, equal forces in all directions, okay? And stress is defined as the force per unit area. Okay, stress is the force per unit area that you applied on the object. And because of the stress that you applied, you see the object deformed, its, its volume changed. Okay, and the strain is the percent deformation. Okay. So in this case, this would be the change in volume divided by the original volume. Okay, now when the volume stresses, what happened to the volume here? Decreased. So the change in volume was negative, so that's why we give it a negative sign. Yeah. So the strain is the percent change in the dimensions of the structure. Okay. So going back to this one, okay, so if you apply a tensile stress here, Stress would be, this is the force, and area of cross-section is the area of cross-section of the bar. So here, in this case, stress would be force divided by area. And strain would be, what is changing? The length dimension is, the change, is changing the most. Again, that's what we'll keep track of. Strain would be change in length. There's the change in length divided by the original length. So for a given stress, what is the percent deformation is the question, okay? Did you guys understand that? Okay. All right, so we define elastic moduli. So this is a number that you're interested in, okay? It is stress divided by strain, okay? So, for instance, for the rod, let's say that was force divided by area and delta L divided by L. Yeah. So, 
for force divided by area. This is elastic modulus. So let's look at this, what this is. Okay. So let's say you have a aluminum rod and a steel rod. Which is stiffer? Steel. Which is stronger? Steel is stronger, right? And so let's say I apply everything is the same. Their lengths are the same and so on. I apply a thousand pound force to the aluminum rod and the and a thousand pound force to the steel rod. Which one will stretch more? I'm sorry? Aluminum. So aluminum will stretch more. All other numbers are the same. Aluminum will stretch more. Elastic modulus is smaller. Okay? So the modulus, the bigger the modulus, the higher the modulus, the stiffer the material. And in general, it's, it's stronger as well. Okay? So that's what an elastic modulus measures. Okay? Just like spring constant, if you guys remember, higher the spring constant, less the spring stretches. Okay? So that's what this is. You guys understand? Oh. All right, so we will be interested in three kinds of deformations. We'll be interested in deformations where the length changes. This is what is called shear deformations. So you will be applying forces, forces in opposite faces of an object. And what is happening? This top surface is moving relative to the bottom surface. Okay? So you're keeping the bottom surface fixed, and this face is moving. Okay? And so what, what, what you don't want happening is the atoms slipping like that and cutting. Sometimes you want to do that. That's what happens when you cut, use a pair of scissors. Okay, you're displacing this plane of atoms against this plane of atoms. Okay. So this is shearing forces and this is bulk modulus. You're changing the volume. Okay, so you're applying stresses where you're changing the length, changing the volume, and changing the relative positions of parallel faces. Okay? So those are the three kinds of stresses you'll apply. That's the kind of, those are the three basic uh, moduli you want to know. Okay, so Young's modulus measures the resistance of solid to changes in its length. You're applying tensile stress. Shear modulus measures the resistance to deformations of parallel planes. Okay. So the stronger the shear modulus, the harder it is to do this. Okay. And bulk modulus measures the resistance of a solid or li liquid to change in its volume. Okay. okay, so here's Young's modulus uh, is for tensile stress. Okay, so here's a it's a metal rod, you apply a force like that, and the stress is force divided divided by unit area. Okay. I mean divided by the area of cross section. So there's the tensile stress, uh, and there's the tensile strain. This tensile strain is change in length divided by the original length. Okay. And so for a given force, given stress, if this chain deformation is smaller, the Young's modulus is higher. And that means that the material is stiffer. Okay. okay, what are the SI units? See, the strain has is dimensionless because that's length, that's length. So that's dimensionless. And force is in newtons, area is in meter square. Newton meter, newton per meter square. Okay. So those are the units for, for for the Young's modulus. And um, when you learn about pressure, pressure has the use same units and that's called Pascals. And so that's why all these units are mega, these are in Pascals, mega Pascals. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so so when you build structures, so if you were building that suspension bridge, you would be looking at graphs like this. Okay. So what you want to do is, uh, so let's say,
you're building this bridge and you don't want the bridge to collapse on you, right? Uh, so what do you do? Well, you, you can do calculations with the worst case scenario. And what is the worst case scenario? You load the bridge up with loaded semis, bumper to bumper, right? So that's the load. Okay, and so what you do is, uh, and then you, uh, depending on how many cables here, each cable, you don't want to stress it that more than that. And then that'll be the strain. And once all the trucks drive away, the stress has gone to zero, and you want the cable to come back to its original shape. Yeah. If each cable bears a stress more than that, you see it'll permanently deform, and maybe, God forbid, it'll even break. Okay. So you want to be in the proportional limit. All your structural elements, you want to be somewhere there. Okay. And uh, so that's what this graph is for. Okay. So what this says is if you apply this much stress, this is the strain it will bear. And once the stress is removed, it hopefully is exhibiting elastic behavior and it will go back to its original shape. <clears throat> All right, so when you use a pair of scissors, what the scissors are doing is it's moving this plane against that plane. And if the scissors apply a large enough force, this plane will permanently shear off from, okay, somewhere in between, those atoms will permanently shear off from each other. And you have a cut. Okay. So the shear stress is the force parallel to a face divided by the area of the face and the shear strain is how much did this face move relative to that and how divided by how far apart they are so delta x by h yeah. so that's the shearing strain okay which one is easier to cut uh, material with uh, higher shear modulus or lower shear modulus? You have a pair of scissors. You want to cut this object. Okay, so for a given force, okay, the larger the distance, lower the shear modulus. And that's what you want. You want, for a given force, you want this surface to move a large distance compared to that. So a lower shear modulus is easier to cut. A cooked piece of noodle is easier to cut than a steel cable. Okay. Did you guys understand that? Yeah. So paper has a smaller shear modulus then, than a sheet of steel, than an aluminum foil. Yeah. <laughs> Bulk modulus, you're changing the volume. Okay. So here you decrease the volume. Okay. And now, so this in most situations, you're decreasing the volume of an object. <clears throat> when would you increase? When would the volume increase for an object? In space. But the all you've done is created vacuum, and so let's say inside there was atmospheric pressure, the forces are not great enough. So you hardly ever have to worry about that, okay? So bulk modulus, and generally you're just decreasing the volume. Okay, so here's the stress. The stress is force per unit area. And the negative sign again, because the change in volume is negative. Okay, so negative times negative, we'll get positive, okay? So there's the bulk modulus. And again, stress is always force per unit area, and change in dimensions is change in dimensions, percentage change in the dimension, whatever dimension it is that you're looking at. So again, these all these numbers are important enough. Okay, so here's 
so for various materials here's the young's modulus bulk modulus and shear modulus okay and you can see higher the moduli uh, uh, you know stiffer the material so for instance you um, steel is stiffer than copper so steel should have bigger numbers than copper okay 11 versus 20 14 versus 16 bulk modulus and 7.5 versus 4.5 Okay. So there are the numbers for copper and there are the numbers for steel. All right, so now that you've learned all of that, you understand this structure. Okay. What <laughs> What drove this design? What inspired this design? Why did you come up with this design? Because most material had better compression. Yeah, so concrete is much stronger under compression than under tension. Okay, so whenever it bears a load, this undergoes tensile stress the bottom which is where cracks happen and so you don't want that to you don't want that to suffer any tensile stress okay. okay or you want to minimize it suffering any tensile stress and that's what inspired them okay so again now you understand that uh, now you understand that these guys are not just silly numbers this number is what inspired that design. Yeah. At the heart of that is the strength of materials. Yeah. So you got to be, be able to learn to, you have to learn to decipher those numbers. Yeah. Okay, this was in the old days. So what this was, was the following. Uh, so you build up this is you guys know polarizers i'll i'll show you pol polarizers in lab if you remind me okay so if you shine a beam of light this is a polarizer you build a structure like that a model of the structure that you're trying to build and so you and then you put a load on top of that okay so so here is a structure and what this shows you okay so you pass polarized light and the stronger the more stress there is the more the polarization turns okay and this is an analyzer so by stressing a model you can figure out which portions are going to wear, bear the largest stresses and then what do you do you slap extra cement there. Okay. So whatever whatever portion bears the greatest stress, you reinforce it. And that was the idea. Okay. Now of course your generation doesn't have to do this. You guys have more sophisticated tools. But that was the days of the old. Okay. All right fellas, so this chapter